now that we have sound, now that we have sound, uh, we're looking for energy, change in energy or W because they mean exactly the same thing, right? All right. Uh, we know that power is equal to work over time, but since W is the same thing as change in energy, we can say that power is equal to delta E over time as well. If we're rearranging this to solve for delta E now, we've got to take the T up to the top. Now, how do we get the T up to the top? It's on the bottom on the right-hand side. To get it to the top on the left-hand side, we're going to do what? Tada? Multiply. Good. So it becomes delta E is equal to power times time. The power is... 1500 watts or 1.50 times 10 to the 3 watts and the time is 360 seconds. Then we multiply those together we end up getting 5.40 three digits, right? If you go back to your original data, it should be three digits. 5.40 times 10 to the 5. And what would the units for that change in energy be? That energy used up by the hair dryer. What would the units be? It doesn't matter whether we're solving for work or delta E, it means exactly the same thing, and the units are exactly the same thing as well. If energy and work are joules, then change in energy or energy used up would also be joules. So 5.40 times 10 to the 5 joules. Question number four. Uh, you're missing a unit in question number four, but I think most people figure this out. It says uh, an 1100 microwave. It should have said an 1100 watt microwave it is turned on for two minutes. What's the energy consumed by the microwave oven? Uh, this is pretty much the same as question number three was. We've got a power here of 1100 watts. Different number, but same idea. The time here is two minutes, which of course we want to convert to seconds. So we're going to multiply that, as Lewis said in the last one, by 60. That gives me 120 seconds. We're looking for the energy consumed, the energy used up. We're looking for delta E again. So once again, P is equal to W over T. That's the equation as it appears on your data sheet, W over T. But since W is defined as delta E, then we can say power is equal to delta E over T as well. Same thing. Take the T up by multiplying. It becomes power times time. Power is 1,100 watts, and the time is 120 seconds. We multiply those together, and we get... We get a number, um, 1.32 times 10 to the 5, but how many digits should we round that final number to? Look back at your data here. Four digits, three digits, final answer should be what? Four or three? Yep. It should be three digits, right? So we're going to say the answer is 1.32 times 10 to the 5. Always go back to your least precise piece of data that you used. You're not your most precise. Okay, the chain is only as strong as the weakest link, not the strongest link. So go back to your data and pick the, the, uh, the smallest number of significant figures. Five is a little bit tougher, a little bit. Okay, it involves more than just rearranging that equation. Five says a two kilogram box is pushed 20 meters with a force of 50 newtons. It takes 8.5 seconds. What's the person's power output? We're going to say uh, uh, M is 2.00 kilograms. We're going to say the displacement is 20 meters. We're going to say the force that's required to do that is 50 newtons. And the time is 8.5 seconds. We want to find power. Any ideas, sir? You guys are going to guide me on this one a little bit more than the other ones. What do you want to try, Jacob? Find work, OK. Um, Jacob is absolutely on the right track here. But even if he wasn't, okay, I've told you a thousand times before, do something that works. And work works here, right? We've got a force. We've got a displacement. We can find the work. Even if it doesn't help us, okay, we haven't done anything wrong by finding work. So if you're not sure where to start, just start somewhere that applies, like work. Now, in the end, that's going to lead us in the right direction, right? But it doesn't have to. We don't, we don't have to be worried about, is this going to get me the answer when I try something? Just, is this OK when I try something? F times D, 50 times 20 newtons, or 20 meters, I should say. That gives me 1,000 joules. What next? 
Now that I've got work, this question should become quite a bit easier. Yep, Carrie? We've got the change in energy, right? W is equal to delta E, because that's how we define work, is the, the change in energy, the energy gained or lost. What am I going to do with that change in energy, though? Right. So power is equal to work over time, or you could write down power is equal to delta E over time, like we did in the last two questions. Doesn't matter. It's same thing. 1,000 joules is our work, or as Kerry said, our change in energy, divided by the time of 8.50 seconds. We're going to do the math on that one, and for this one, we're going to get 118 watts. Where should I round this one to? How many digits? Three, 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 three. Final answer should be, this one's an easy one, right? Final answer should be, right, how many digits? Right. Correct the way it's written now, three digits. Get loose. Yes. No, absolutely not. No, it's a good question. Um, Lewis just asked a great question, guys. He said, watts is the same as joules per second, right? Yes, absolutely. Right? Work is joules. Time is seconds. Joules per second is the same thing, right? What if we had it written here, instead of 118 watts, let's say Lewis just had one of those moments where he forgot you know, that power was measured in watts, he said, oh, okay, how am I going to figure this out? I can't remember it. I can't remember it. Oh, you know what? I'm just going to write down joules per second because that's the way it is in the equation, right? Is that okay to write down on the test? Absolutely it is. Absolutely. Okay, watts just takes you about a half a second less to write down. Other than that, it's no better than, than joules per second. Okay? You can always do that, by the way, guys. Let's say even you're calculating, you know, just as a bit of an aside, you're calculating force. And, I mean, you're not going to forget what unit force is measured in, right? But let's pretend you did for a second. Okay, you just, your brain just wasn't thinking. You knew how to calculate it, but you forgot what unit force is measured in. So you look at it and say, oh, can't figure it out, but I don't want to lose a half a mark for not putting the units in. So I'm going to say mass is kilograms. Acceleration is meters per second squared. Oh, my units for force are kilograms meters per second squared. Would that be okay on a test? Of course it would. It's right. It's just not quite as convenient as writing down Newtons, that's all. So you can, Lewis, you can always do that. Even if it's more complicated than joules per second, you can always do that. And it's always okay. Any more questions there? Okay. We are going to do right now the last thing that we do in this unit. If we looked at Oh, boy, have we looked at a lot of stuff in this unit. Okay, we looked at um, simple forces. We looked at Newton's first law, Newton's second law, pulley problems, hill problems. Um, we looked at uh, elevator problems. We looked at Newton's third law, finding the force, the tension, the force in between objects. Um, we looked at uh, kinetic energy, potential energy. That's just a spider. It's okay. Should kill it. Maybe get some rain tomorrow. Warm up here and get some rain instead of snow. Um, kinetic energy, potential energy. We looked at work. We looked at power. And finally, the last thing that we're going to look at is called the law of conservation of mechanical energy. Mechanical energy is not a new topic, even though we may not have used those words before. Mechanical energy is just the total of kinetic and potential energy. So if an object at the top of a hill is moving and it's got kinetic energy, but it's also got potential because it's at a height, then we would say its mechanical energy is whatever its kinetic is plus whatever its potential is. As you pull an elastic back and let that elastic go, it's, it, it has not yet been completely released, but it's moving. It's still got potential. It's still got kinetic. Its total mechanical energy would be whatever its potential plus its kinetic was. Who can tell me what the word conser conservation means? Where have you heard that word before? Conservation. Okay. Did your hand up? No. Sorry, I thought your hand was up. Where have you heard that word cons conservation or conserved? What do we need to conserve? What do you hear about what do you hear about all the time now in the news for the last, well, pretty much for your lifetimes, for the last 10 or 15 years? We need to conserve what? 
okay. We need to conserve the environment. It kind of goes along with that, right? We need to conserve the environment. Let's conserve the environment. What does that mean, conserve the environment? It has nothing to do with physics other than the word conserve. If we want to conserve the environment, we want to keep it the same, right? We don't want to destroy our environment. We want to keep it the same as it is now. Conserve means stay the same. Conserve means don't lose any, don't gain any. Just keep it the way that it is. Conservation means the same thing, essentially, right? So the law of conservation of mechanical energy, it's a law, which means it's got to be, okay? A law has to be. The law of conservation of mechanical energy says that mechanical energy has got to stay the same. You can't, you can't create mechanical energy. You can't destroy mechanical energy. It's got to stay the same all the time. If we account for everything, if we account for everything, all the types of energy that exist within a system, then that total energy will always stay the same even when something's happened. I've gone down a hill. Look, we gained kinetic energy when we went down a hill. But we lost potential energy. The total amount of energy stayed the same. Energy can't be created. It can't be destroyed. It can be transformed from one type to another. We can convert kinetic to potential. We can convert potential to kinetic. When I stretch that elastic back and get ready to pull it, get ready to let it go, so it flies off and hits somebody, we're converting potential energy as it's stretched to kinetic energy as it's let go. We're converting chemical potential in my body to elastic potential energy in the, in the elastic as I stretch it. The total amount of energy in that interaction always has to stay the same. If we account for everything. What about a car? Hey, I got I one for you. Slam on your brakes in a car. You come to a stop, right? You had kinetic energy, and now you got nothing. So how was energy conserved there? Didn't we destroy energy in that process of slamming the brakes on the car? You had 1,000 joules of kinetic, and now you got nothing. Energy's gone, right? Is it? Yeah. Yeah, it transforms into sound, because you hear the car slamming on the brakes, right? But there's actually, as much as you hear more than you feel this, um, there's actually more of another type of energy produced than there is sound. What other kind of energy would that be? Friction is not a type of energy. It's, it's, it's a force, but that's what causes this other kind of energy. Thermal energy, yeah. The tires heat up, right? You see these black marks on the pavement. You know what the black marks on the pavement are? Rubber from your tires, right? Some of it is. You know what some of it is? Believe it or not, it's actually, you don't see as much black marks on, on concrete roads as you do on pavement roads. Why not? It's white. You should see more on concrete, right, than you see on pavement. When you slam on your brakes, it actually generates so much heat that it melts tar in the asphalt. So part of what you see in your skid mark on, a, on pavement is actually melted tar in pavement, okay? which, again, you don't see on, uh, on uh, cement. So there's a lot of heat generated. If we account for that, then the total amount of energy was the same. If we had 1,000 joules of kinetic energy before the car slammed on the brakes, then we've got 1,000 joules of sound energy, as Carrie said, and thermal energy, as Jacob, I think it was, said. If we add all those up, it ends up being exactly the same. It ends up being 1,000 joules. Energy can't be created. It can't be destroyed. We can just transform it from one kind to another. Now. Sometimes we add energy to a system so it looks like energy is created. Your boat, your sailboat is in the water and it's cruising along at a nice speed and all of a sudden it just starts going faster because a wind hit it. Well, didn't we create kinetic energy there? No, we've just added energy to the system. If we account for all the energy, including the energy of the boat, and the kinetic energy of the wind, then the total amount of energy will still stay the same. Sometimes it just looks like energy was created. It never is. It just looks like it. 
if we account for all the sources like wind or somebody pushing something or whatever, then energy isn't created. Similarly, sometimes it looks like energy is, is destroyed. Like in the case of the car slamming on the brakes. Kinetic energy turned into nothing, right? But if we account for the sound energy, as Carrie said, and the, the thermal energy, as Jacob said, then it's not destroyed. It's just taken away due to, due to friction. It's converted to some other kind of energy. If we account for all the kinds, then energy will never be destroyed, or created, for that matter. The problems that we're going to focus on involve problems where we don't have wind to add energy to the system. That just makes it a little bit too complicated for us. We could do it, but, it's, but it makes it more complicated. If we solve a problem where friction is not taking energy away from the system, then again, it makes it, it makes it easier. It's less complicated. We could do it if friction was taking energy away from the system, but we won't bother looking that deeply into problems here. We'll focus on questions where it's fairly easy to account for everything where we don't have these external sources of energy being taken away or energy being added to the system. If we do focus on those problems, those limited number of problems, then we're always going to ultimately set up a problem like this. We say EI equals EF. The initial energy, the initial mechanical energy that we start with, is equal to the final mechanical energy, the energy that we finish with. Which makes sense to us, right? If total energy stays the same, if energy isn't created, if energy isn't destroyed, then the energy that you start with is always going to be the same as the energy that you end with, as long as you're accounting for everything. So that doesn't seem... If we just look at that one line, EI equals EF, that doesn't seem really useful in solving a problem. So what are we going to do with that one line, EI equals EF? Well, we've got to ask ourselves three questions on both sides of this. Okay, we've got to look at the beginning of the problem, the initial point of the problem, and ask yourself three questions. Then we've got to look at the final part of the problem, ask yourself the same three questions. Those three questions are as follows. One, is there a height? Is there a height? At the beginning of the problem, is there a height? If the answer to that question is yes, then we sub in MGH because there's gravitational potential energy if there's a height. Second question, is there a spring or an elastic that's stretched or compressed? If the answer is yes, then sub in 1 half kx squared for EI or for EF. And finally, the third question, what do you think the third question might be? We said, is there a height? Is there a spring in the elastic that's stretched or compressed? Third question, is it moving, right? Is the object moving? If it is, then we're going to sub in 1 half mv squared for EI or for EF. If there's both, right, if you've got something moving and at a height, then let's sub in mgh and 1 half mv squared. If there's a spring that's stretched and a height, then let's sub in mgh and 1 half kx squared. Let's take a look at an example that kind of puts this into play here now. Unfortunately, it's not in your book, so you're going to have to copy this one down. All right, when we look at this question, um, lots of you are probably going to look at it and say, well, wait, we don't need any new topic, any new concept to answer this question. Let's just say, I want to find the speed of the ball as it hits the ground. Let's just say Vf squared is equal to Vi squared plus 2ad. Is that a valid equation for this situation? It's a group B equation, right? Is this a group B problem? If the ball accelerates downward, is it a group B problem? Yes, it's a valid equation. It would get you the answer. That's fine. You're allowed to use that. But I'm showing you another way now to solve this problem, a way that ends up being a little bit more versatile. Isn't any better than, this, than VF squared for this particular problem? but becomes more versatile for other problems that are a little bit more complicated than this. So we're going to introduce it with a relatively simple problem, even though we don't have to use that concept for something as simple as this question. 
we got a mass of 500 grams here. We're going to convert that to, kilo, to kilograms, so let's make it 0 0.500 kilograms. We've got a speed of 5 meters per second. What are we going to call that? Is that going to be V? Is that going to be VI? Or is that going to be VF? Derek, what is that? V, VI, or VF? Sorry? VI. Yeah, it's the initial speed. Now, if we were looking at it as velocity, then we would make it negative 5 because it's thrown downward, right? But since we're solving this as a conservation of energy problem, and energy is a scalar, we're not going to worry about that direction. Um, let's call this 35.0 meters. We would typically, the way that we used to solve a problem like this, call this displacement, because that's how far the ball falls, right? This time we're going to call it HI, the initial height, 35 meters. We want to find VF, the speed of the ball as it hits the ground. So again, although we could use that other equation, VF squared is equal to VI squared plus 2AD, let's try this one. EI equals EF. Remember those three questions you got to ask yourself? Don't forget to ask those three questions in your head. Not out loud, because it's going to get really loud in here if 23 of you starts asking three questions out loud. Okay, in your heads. What are the three questions? Okay, what's one of them, Lewis? Is there a height? Is there a height here at the beginning of this problem? We're looking at EI here right now. Is there a height at the beginning of this problem? Lewis? Yes, there is. So let's sub in MGH. Because if there's a height, there's potential energy. Put in MGH. I don't care what order you ask those three questions in, by the way. What's another one of those three questions? Doesn't matter what order here. Seth, what's another one of those three questions? Jacob? Is it moving? Is it moving, Jacob? Yes, it is. At the beginning of the problem, it's moving at 5 meters per second. So let's sub in 1 half mv squared. Right. Put a plus in between them. Some people want to put a multiplication sign in between them for some reason. We want to find the total. We don't, we don't multiply things to get a total. We add things to get a total. What's the third question? Tyler? Is there a spring or an elastic that's being compressed or stretched? Good. Is there? No, there isn't. So there is no, no elastic potential, right? No 1 half kx squared. Okay, left side is done. Yep. Oh, yes. Yes, it should. Yeah, 1 half mvi squared. Thank you, Haley. Good point. Now let's look at the end of the problem. After this ball has hit the ground, no, I shouldn't say after it's hit the ground, as it hits the ground, how fast is the ball moving as it hits the ground? Three questions again, right? Aiden, what's one of those three questions? Is there a spring that's being stretched to compress? When it hits the ground, is there a spring that's being stretched to compress? Is there? We don't have a spring or an elastic in this question, right? There is no spring or elastic or anything like that in the question. So there is no elastic potential. Stephanie? Yep. Yep. No, no. Um, good question, though. Stephanie just said, her question, if you didn't hear that, was, didn't you say that it always equals out? The initial always equals the final. The answer to that question was yes, it does. The energy initial always equals the energy final. So shouldn't, her secondary question was, shouldn't we just have to calculate the left-hand side then? Well, if we're looking for the energy at the end of the problem, yes. Because the energy at the beginning would be the same as the energy at the end. But we're not. We're looking for the final speed. And the final speed won't be, right? And just intuitively, when you drop a ball, it speeds up. So the final speed won't. The energy will be the same, but the height will decrease as the speed increases. Okay, so we've established over here that there is no spring or elastic in this question, so there is no spring or elastic potential energy at the end of the question. What's the, what's the second question that you've got to ask yourself? Bart? Second question. Okay. 
Second question. Go ahead. Is there a height? At the end of the problem, is there a height? Lewis? No, there isn't. So there isn't going to be MGH at the end of a problem, is there? It's on the ground. What's the third question? Yep. Is it moving? Okay. Jacob, is it moving as it hits the ground? Not after, because it's not, right? After it hits the ground. Is it moving as it hits the ground? It is, yeah. yeah. Jacob, that's a, that's a tough one for people sometimes, though, hey? Um, but I think, I think Haley was our volunteer the time I did a little demonstration. We had Haley laying on the floor. We pretended we were going to drop a hole puncher on her. Of course, we weren't going to do that. Um, it would have hurt, right? The demonstration was meant to show that, look, when it hits her, not after it hits her, but as it hits her, the hole puncher is moving. Because if it's not moving when it hits her, it's not going to hurt, right? So as things hit the ground, they're moving. After they hit the ground, they're not. But as they hit the ground, they're moving. Jacob, do you want to change your answer there? Is it moving when it hits the ground? Yes, it is, right? So we're going to say 1F MVF squared. There's no potential energy of any kind, but there is kinetic energy at the end of this problem, after it's fallen, as it hits the ground. Now, this doesn't always happen, but it does in this question. A little shortcut. Anybody see it? Yeah. yeah, cancel out the mass. Now, some of you are going to think, no, wait a second, you can't do that. You can't cancel out one mass on one side and then two masses on the other side. Why not? You can cancel out one mass from every term as long as it appears in every term. So although we don't need to cancel it out because we have the mass given to us, it does make our life a little bit easier. Let's plug our numbers in here. G is 9.81, HI is 35.0 meters. VI squared is uh, 5.0. And we're solving for VF. Now, it looks kind of tricky to rearrange. But if we calculate a number on the left-hand side, get a number for that, it starts looking a little bit easier. Let's do that here. 9.81 times 35. Let's add that to, use some brackets here, 0.5 times 5 squared. And those brackets. The left side is 355.85. How do you take the half over? Got a couple choices here. Aiden, what's one of them? We could multiply it by 2, or we could divide by half. Either way works. I usually multiply it by 2, but it doesn't really matter here. You do whatever way makes most sense to you. Okay, when we do that, we get 711.7 .7 equals VF squared. How do we get rid of this squared? We, how do we get rid of that squared? Yeah, so square root 711.7, and we get 26.67. Oops, I was going to put a vector sign there. I shouldn't because I'm solving for speed, not velocity. 26.67. How many digits should I round it to? One, two, three, four? 70? Three digits, yeah. So we're going to say 26.7 meters per second. You're going to have to do this calculation several times on your field trip assignment. Okay, when we go to West Edmonton Mall in, in uh, almost two weeks, okay, just under two weeks, okay, you will have to do this on the roller coaster. There's a couple different roller coaster assignments you have to do. Okay, they'll both involve doing this calculation. Okay, is this hard? I don't think it is, but it is a step forward for us. It is a step up because it's not just a matter of here's my givens, here's an equation. This time I have to get my equation. I have to get it myself. I have to derive my own equation. 
Hey, I got MGH on my data sheet. I've got one FMV squared on my data sheet, but nowhere do I see that equation as it's written on the board right now. So you've got to figure that out. But there's an easy way to figure it out. Okay, EI equals EF. In both initial and final, ask yourself three questions. Okay, ask yourself three questions. Seth, what's one of those three questions? Is it moving? Good. Okay, if it's moving, then we've got MGH. What's another one of those three questions? Is there a height? Good. If there's a height, then there's MGH. Okay, what's another one of those three questions? This one we don't see as often. Is there a spring or an elastic stretched or compressed? If there is, 1 FKX squared, right? Ask those three questions, initial and final, sub in your equations, and then sub in your values, you're done. Got it? All right, here's what I want you to work on right now. You have your last worksheet, your conservation of energy worksheet. I'd like you to work on the first five questions on your conservation of energy worksheet, please. These questions, some of them involve mathematics, like we just did. Some of them simply involve describing the energy conversions, right? Kinetic energy is converted to potential, or potential energy is converted to kinetic, and so on. Okay, I want you to do all five of these questions. Put up your hand, ask me if you have any questions or have any trouble. Okay, but use the one that we did, we just did, as a guide. Can remember just the steps. Step number one, EI equals EF. Step number two, ask yourself those three questions. Step number three, plug in your equations and your numbers and solve. All right, let's get at that. All right, everyone, let's take a look at question number one here, just as another example, now that you've had a chance to work through this a little bit here. Uh, it says a student on the roof of the school throws a 500-gram ball off the edge of the school at a speed of 15 meters per second. Notice it doesn't actually say how the ball is thrown, whether it's downward or thrown upward or thrown straight out or at an angle of 30 degrees, it doesn't say. But it doesn't matter. If we're analyzing this as, as an energy problem, we don't need to know the direction. We just need to know how fast it's moving, the speed, not the velocity. Now, the ball hits the ground at a speed of 24.5 meters per second. We want to find out how high the school was. Now, Everybody, I think, knows that we're going to start off by saying EI equals EF. It's just a matter of what we do with EI equals EF. If you don't know what to start with that, then any time you have a problem involving a change in height like this, you can do this. There's other options sometimes, but this is always something that's available to you as well. All right, we get asked three questions at the beginning of this problem, EI and EF. Okay, the first question is, is there a height? Leah, is there a height? Yes, there is. So what kind of energy do we have as a result of the height? Yeah. What kind do we have? What kind of energy do we have if there's a height? Gravitational potential energy, right? So it's MGH. So let's sub in MGH there for the initial energy. Because there's a height. What's the second question that you ask yourself, Derek? Right? Is it moving? Is it moving, Ryan? At the beginning of the problem, is it moving? Yes, it is at 15 meters per second, right? So what kind of energy do we have as a result of that? Right. Kinetic energy, one half mv squared. We add the two together, right? It's moving and it's got a height. It's got kinetic, and it's got potential energy. Which one comes first? It doesn't matter. There is no spring or elastic here, so there's not going to be any 1 half kx squared. At the end of the problem now, at the end of the problem, what are the three questions? you have a question? Yeah, that's the same thing as I did in the last example, isn't it? Yeah, it is 1 half mvi. Thank you, again. At the end of the problem, let's ask yourself the same three questions. What's one of those three questions? It's one of those three questions, Bart. Is it moving? Is it moving at the end of the problem when it hits the ground, Bart? Yeah, 24.5 meters per second. So if it's moving at the end of the problem, then we've got kinetic energy at the end, right? 
Atlanta, what's the second question that you could ask yourself at the end of the problem? Is there a height? At the end of the problem? When it's hit the ground, is there a height? Okay, when it's on the ground, there's no height anymore, right? So there is no potential energy as a result of that, no MGH because of that. There's no spring or elastic, so this is it. Now, somebody was asking me about question number two. Got to question number two, and he thought, I could do it the same way, except I don't have mass. Well, question number one, you're given a mass, but you don't need it. Why don't you need the mass in question number one? Okay? It's the same in every term, which means it cancels out. Okay, we don't need to cancel it out in question number one because we've got the mass. We need to cancel it out in question number two because we don't have the mass. All right, 9.81 times the initial height, we don't know that, plus one-half of vi squared, 15 squared, equals one-half of vf squared, 24.5 squared. All right, this one's a little bit trickier to solve for mathematically, so let's do that now. Um, let's get a half of 15 squared first, 0.5 times 15 squared. So I get 9.81H plus 112.5 equals a half of 24.5. Of, uh, 24.5. 300.125. Solving for H, what do you got to get rid of first? 70? Uh, no, not the 9.81. Get rid of what's what's not attached. What's not attached to the H? The 112. So let's take that over to the other side by subtracting. You say 300.125 minus 112.5, 187.65. And now, Stephanie, we get rid of the 9.81, right, by dividing. So 187 divided by 9.81. 19.1. So you got lucky then. So just be careful on that. So we get a height of 19.1 meters, which which makes sense to us, right? 19.81 meters. That's that's a pretty high school. Like that's like uh, what would that be about six stories? About a six-story school, but. I mean, this thing is moving at 24 and a half meters per second when it reaches the ground. Of course, it's going to be pretty high, right? Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, good, good question. Good question. Who can answer that for us? If we can cancel out the masses, couldn't we also cancel out the one half? Good. Good. The one half isn't in every term. Okay, the M is. That's the difference, right? In order to cancel something out, it's got to be in every term. Okay, there are situations. Um, I can't think of one right now in physics 20 that this happens in, but it does happen a couple of times in physics 30 when you can cancel out a number like that, like one half. Um, but it has to appear in every term to do that. Let's say, you know what? I, th I can think of one right now in physics 20. Don't know if you'll actually see it, but it's possible. Let's say you had a problem where it was not gravitational potential, but elastic potential that was converted to kinetic energy. Now the mass doesn't cancel, right? Because it doesn't appear in every term. But the half does appear in every term. So you could cancel it in that case. Yep. Yes, you could. Yeah, absolutely. You could multiply everything by 2. If you did that, um, then the halves would disappear but it would become 2 times 9.81 there, right? 19.62. So I'm not sure that that would make it easier or harder, just a little bit different. If it's more comfortable for, it's more comfortable that way, then that's okay. You can do whatever you want as long as you do it to every term, right? Okay, it also asks us actually to describe the energy transformations that are taking place. It's a pretty straightforward one, right? What do we start with? Yeah. Kinetic and gravitational potential. We end up with kinetic. So what's the conversion that's taking place? 
What are we losing and what are we gaining? What decreases as it falls there? Yep. Okay. Potential decreases. And what does that potential convert it to? Uh, yeah, what kind of energy is it converted to? Right. So potential is converted to kinetic. That's it. The answer to that, describe the transformations that are taking place. Well, gravitational potential energy is converted to kinetic energy. The total stays the same. We gain kinetic, we lose potential. Yep, okay. Oh, yeah, good question. After it, after it hits, as it hits, it's still moving, right, at 24 and a half. But after it hits, it's stopped, right? So then is everything zero? Yeah, it would be, actually. So then energy is destroyed, right? But we said it can't be destroyed. Well, what actually happens? It's not actually moving zero. It's close, but not actually zero after it hits. What happens is the ball hits the ground. Yep. It compresses, yeah. So it becomes it can become elastic potential at that point. But what does it also do? It puts the force into the ground. It moves the earth. Okay. Now, how fast is the earth going to move as a result of that hit? Such a small speed that you're never going to notice it, right? Well, I shouldn't say that. Sometimes if you're standing next to it and you drop something hard, you notice it, right? You notice a localized area of the Earth moving a little bit, a little mini earthquake. Bottom line is, it is converted to kinetic energy of the Earth, but the mass of the Earth is so big that it's, the speed of it is effectively zero after that collision. Does that make sense? Good question. Okay, let's keep working on two, three, and four, two, three, four, and five. Those will be your homework questions for tonight. We'll take a look at those tomorrow, and then uh, we'll be ready for a test on, on Monday. Sorry, guys, just uh, brought to my attention one little thing. Question number three, it should say, is dropped. What difference does that make, dropped or thrown? Haley, what difference does that make? Right. If it's dropped, it's got just potential, no kinetic, right, no speed. If it's thrown, then it's got both. And we would have to know an initial speed in that case, right?